Hey folks, Randy Newberg here. We are doing another one of our videos about e-scouting. And this time, quite a bit has changed. I now have 3D maps from Go Hunt to do my e-scouting with. I have a Colorado First Rifle Elk Tag. And the reason we picked this one as, as an example is it's that transition period between the calendar period I call peak rut and the calendar period I call post rut. So the elk are in this kind of, am I in the rut, am I not, da da da. So there's that transition going on be, between the elk or among the elk in terms of what their behavior is. Well, that behavior change also changes their needs. So rather than give you a specific unit and do this in, we're going to pick Rocky Mountain National Park in Colorado. Very similar terrain, very similar to the area that I have my elk tag in. In the last two months, I've been working with Go Hunt. Once I found out they were doing maps, I went to them and said, all right, here are a whole ton of tools that I think you could put in your mapping features that are going to help me and probably help you as we do our e-scouting for elk. And the premise is we're hunting public land we are hunting highly pressured elk. So you really got to put your time in to figure out where are the elk going to be. Because if you come out for a hunt, say you have five, six, seven days, if you can do effective e-scouting and that allows you to avoid, I guess, say one, two, three days that you kind of are just floundering. And, I, and I've been there. I show up and it's like, oh, that's not what it looked like. Uh, if you can save those, those few days and have them be hunting days instead of kind of learning the landscape, that's a big win. Your likelihood of success goes way up because the more days you are there with your dialed in pattern, every day your odds get even better and better and better and better. What I'm going to do is explain to you, here's my thought process. Here's what I'm doing and why I'm thinking it. And then we're going to grab screenshots of the Go Hunt 3D mapping system, the desktop version here, to show you what I'm talking about. Uh, grab Colorado, click on all the layers that I want, and drill down here to Rocky Mountain National Park. Now I, I'm, I'm here in my 3D, and I'm thinking about this kind of like when you first look at a map, like, well, where are they going to be? For me, e-scouting is kind of saying where they won't be. So where are the places I can cross off my map so that when I'm all done, I don't have a whole lot of places left that I have to focus on. So they're going from the need or, or the, the desire for breeding to sanctuary. Hmm. All right. Am I looking for just any bull? Am I looking for an older bull? Well, I spent three points to get this unit. I think some people with two even got this, this hunt. So now I got to be thinking, all right, I probably would like to shoot a four and a half year old bull or older. That's, I've now added another challenge because if it's just any elk, then I don't care if it's a young bull that's mixed in with the cows at this time. He's just thinking, well, the big boys left. This is all for me. Well, I'm wanting that older age class. So I know in that part of October, that older age class is now closer to the post rut phase. The younger age class of bulls are still kind of trickling around in the, oh man, this is all mine, what I'd call the peak rut or the, the fake peak rut phase for the young bulls. So knowing that, I'm gonna focus more on sanctuary areas and less on where I think the cows would be. The cows are gonna always be where the food is. The, the older mature bulls are going to be more likely in that post-rut period. So what's that post-rut period about? It's about sanctuary, sanctuary, sanctuary. How, do, how, how, how does a bull recover from the rut? Well, they go find some place where hunters aren't gonna find them, where they have water, they have food, but most importantly, they have a sanctuary. And sanctuary, I always say, is if you walk up and look down into a canyon or you look up on a big mountain and say, I don't want to shoot an elk there, 
odds are there's some sanctuaries in those kind of locations. Now I know, all right, Colorado is a high elevation state. The unit I'm hunting is going to be about the same elevations as this unit. And one of the tools that we've been working on with Go Hunt are these elevation bands. And so I pull up, I'm over here on the screen, and it's like, all right, transition range. I know the winter range in this area is somewhere about 8,000 to 8,500 feet is where the winter range starts. It, it runs from about 8,500 down to about mm, 7,000. That's winter range. Well, it's not winter time, October 10th. The high end of the transition range where it then becomes summer range, so the summer range in this area is almost 12,000 feet. So from their summer period to their winter period, these elk use this transition range that I'm gonna say is 11,500 to 12,000 down to somewhere in this 8,000 to 8,500. So by using these elevation bands, I can click on, all right, this one of these bands is 8,500 to 10,000 and then 10,000 to 11,500. So I'm covering that 3,000 feet of that transition range by just clicking two little icons on my Go Hunt map system. So now when I do that, I look at my screen and it's like, wow, I have just eliminated so much of the possible places where I think elk will be at the time I have my tag. Where in that transition range are the elk going to be? Well, you don't really know until you understand what's the weather been like, because if it's been an early winter and there's a ton of snow up high, and say you got a really big, wet, heavy September storm, and maybe an early October storm. Those elk, even the bulls, might be moving away from the top of the transition range where the summer and transition range meet, and they might be down in the middle of the transition range. Whereas if it's Indian summer and it's been really hot, they're gonna be way up at the top of that transition range. So what I'm gonna do I, I've identified these two bands of elevation. I'm going to click one of them off. So now all I have is the 10,000 to 11,500 foot band. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to do some of my scouting based on that band because that gives me the alternative that if it's a warm summer, this is probably the band of, of elevation those elk are going to be at. If it's an early winter, I could just do the reverse. I could click this one off and use the 8,500 to 10,000 band and know that's the likelihood of where they're going to be. Now that you've identified where this transition range is and whether you want to identify the top part or the bottom part or the whole part, those are the areas where I'm looking for sanctuary. And I go into the 3D version of this. And this is, this is where I'm saying 3D is a big surprise to me. And by that, when I heard that, oh, there's gonna be 3D available, I've looked at 3D on Google Earth and stuff, but I never really got that used to it because in Google Earth, I wasn't getting the, all the other layers that I rely upon. So it's like, ah, nah, I, well, now that I have 3D with all these layers, with these tools, the game is changing. So here's some things I'm gonna look at. And this is just based on what I know about a post-rut elk hunt. A post-rut elk hunt is a glassing game. I am going to hike into places. I'm gonna find knobs, ridges, whatever, where I can glass as much terrain as possible. So if I can find a burn, everybody knows that I'm a big fan of burns. I always hunt the newest burn from one year, I, I, I'd like it to be at least a year old, and then I back up from there, okay. If it's two years, okay, three, four. I hunt the newest burn, and I don't hunt, like if a burn has this weird shape to it, I don't hunt and look right in the middle. I'm looking at the little fingers of a burn that jut out, or jut in, or whatever. 
those are the places, those, those disruptions, those, those edges, that is where elk are going to be. So I'm going to go and look at this and say, all right, where are the disruptions to the canopy? Whether it's a burn, whether it's an avalanche chute, logging, you name it, I'm going to identify those locations. So when I'm looking for these sanctuaries that have the component of water and food nearby, I'm looking for those within this transition range. Colorado is a place with a lot of water. Most of the mountain areas of Colorado have plenty of water. It's from melting snow, it's from springs, it's whatever. So unlike Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Utah, I'm not going to be able to use water as one of my concentrating factors here. So I'm going to assume most every sanctuary I'm looking at probably has some sort of water nearby. So now, where are the sanctuaries where food is nearby? And a lot of times it doesn't take much food. It might just be an avalanche chute that has some, you know, timber here, open here, and there's food there. And the bull just moves two, three hundred yards a day. So those are the kind of places that I'm looking for. And I'm not going there and just setting up on it. I'm going to be back here where I can look at this sanctuary and that sanctuary and this one and that one and that one. A sanctuary is not this gargantuan area. People, I think, figure that, oh, this basin that's three mile kind of radius right here, that's a sanctuary. Yeah, it probably is to some degree, but within that three mile radius, there are spots on the spot. You've heard me say that before. What are those spots on the spot? That's what I'm looking for. And then I'm backing out to where's the glassing point that allows me to view as many of those as I can from one position. Because I'm going to be up there before daylight waiting for the sun to rise. And I'm probably going to stay there all day long till the sun goes down. Because there's some slopes that when the sun hits them, the elk are going to move off that, that slope right away. But then there's an opposing slope where the sun's over here, it stays shaded longer. Well, if I'm here, I can glass that slope and I can glass this slope. And then as the sun does its arc, the same thing happens, but it's just a mirror of what happened in the morning. So in my mind, I'm just trying to think of glassing, glassing, glassing. And nothing has changed my idea of where I can glass better than 3D. I'm identifying these places that might be sanctuaries based on how far they are from roads and trails. And is there some proximity of a canopy disruption nearby? And is it within that band of, of elevations from 8,500 to 11,500? Because this is a glassing game, very often I'm looking for elk that are bedded. Yeah, in the morning you're looking for elk that are up moving. But what do I do the rest of the day? I mean, when I know the elk have went to their beds, I want to be able to glass locations where I think the elk would bed during the day. Okay, we're going to walk through what that means. That means the top third of the slope. So if there's a bench up here and then a slope going down here into a drainage, elk are going to be somewhere between that crest and the top third where the, that top third ends. Every bit of research, all the studies say that elk prefer the top third of a ridge. Now, it might be a ridge that's 1,000 feet in elevation. Maybe it's just a ridge that's only 200 feet of elevation. Whatever it is, I'm looking at those places that once they go in bed, they're going to be in that top third of wherever the ridge line is. That is going to be my later in the morning till late afternoon once they're back up on their feet. Those are the places I'm going to be looking. Then I have another thing I'm looking at, and this is where 3D, these, these last two pieces here is where 3D has really changed my mind on this just in the last month as I've been playing with this and thinking about how I could not do this when I had 2D. So, I told you I'm going to look at the top third of any slope. So 
if the mountain slopes this way. Here's the other thing with elk. And again, if you read all the studies, all the, all the information out there, elk want to bed on a slope that is less than 20 degrees of a slope. Huh. Well, how do I know what a 20 degree slope is? Well, you can go into trigonometry and kind of figure it out. If you know anything about geometry, you can kind of figure it out. And it's where this line tool can really help you also. If you want to drill way down and you say here and here and with the line tool, you can see that now on 3D. It's so visual when you're rolling your, your screen, it's like, oh, huh, I never knew that. And you know, slopes are never perfect like this, right? And it never stays at the same gradient forever. Sometimes you might have a really steep slope, but yet there's a little bench that juts out here. And you don't see that usually with 2D, but now with 3D, I can fly around and look at it and I'm like, ooh, look at that little bench. It, it's steep, but then it flattens out to almost like a flat spot or maybe a three degree slope. That's a spot that bulls are going to bed. Where are my glassing locations where I can look into those kind of spots? And so I go to my maps and I start looking for those kind of spots. Again, within the confines of the proper elevation bands, within the confines of sanctuaries that are far from roads. And I start marking all these places. Another tool that uh, Gohunt has come up with here that is really helpful that, and this gets to my glassing locations. Sometimes I'm on this spot right here and I think to myself, well, back to the back corner of that drainage back there, I want to be able to glass that. Well, without 3D, I may not realize that there's a little roll to a ridge out in front of me, and I can't see that from what I thought was the best glassing location on the hill or on the mountain or in the unit. Well, when I take my line tool with uh, Go Hunt's 3D maps, it'll be, you'll see that it's really bright for where I can see, and then anything where an elevation rise has kind of blocked out that vision, it makes that line go faint. So I was like, ah, oh, I can't, from here, I can't see all the way back into that drainage or where that little flat spot is. So that means I either got to raise my glassing point so I can look down in there, or I got to move somewhere. Maybe I got to move over to that side of the drainage to look this way in there. What I'm providing here isn't for the purpose of regurgitating all that we've done in the past about e-scouting plans. But to show you how these tools, when combined with 3D maps, can be way more powerful for your e-scouting. Anyhow, I hope that helps. I hope it gives you some idea of how to use these tools. Uh, gives you a real case study of how I'm doing this e-scouting for my Colorado hunt. Maybe I'll go there and I won't find an elk and all of you will say, never. What are you doing, man? Hopefully, and I'm pretty confident, we will go there, and when I look at all the locations I've identified, when we drudge in there and haul our camp in there, uh, we'll, we'll be in the elk. Want to thank Go Hunt for making this video possible? Link down below. Go sign up for the Insider, and now you get this 3D map. Use promo code Randy when you sign up, and you get $50 of mad money. Uh, get a gift card for 50 bucks in their gear shop. But now, instead of just draw odds and all the great strategy articles, all the stuff that was really valuable before, now, for nothing extra, you get this whole suite, this desktop planning module. Some people call it maps. To me, yeah, it's maps, but it's planning. It's a research tool. Just like so many of the other tools that we think of, this is now bundled in with the Insider and you get it for free. But if you have questions about how 3D can work in some of this, leave them in the comments down below because I'm interested to see where the, the viewers are seeing applications or having uh, gaps in, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we could do this or we could do that? 
And so it'll also give me ideas of where to expand when we continue to talk about how 3D imagery and layers is going to change how we do our e-scouting. Thanks for watching.